Good evening. And welcome to The Way Out Show. I'm your host, Dane McCarthy, broadcasting to you from FEMA Region 5, deep in the bowels of the United Police State of America. Today is September 2nd, 2015, and we've got a fairly long video to show you today uh, with a guy named Larry Nichols, who is, uh, has some very dubious reputation, but was an insider and still is in some ways an insider in the Clinton uh, family, in the Clinton machine. During the 80s, the 90s, uh, he's no, he knows a lot, and whether you uh, feel that his claims have credence, that is up for you to decide. Uh, before we go to that, uh, I do want to mention that, of course, Obama has made this historic trip to Alaska and stood in front of a melting glacier and talked about how we have to do something about climate change. Now, this is just, to me and to many others, the ultimate in hypocrisy, because at the very same time that he's doing this, he is also trying to open up the Arctic for more and more oil drilling, offshore oil drilling. And it's almost as if he wants, he's doing this to, to try to uh, subvert people's, people from, from making the claim that he doesn't care about the environment. So what does he do? He does both at the same time. He makes a very strong statement that humans are causing climate change and then engages in this very deceptive uh, effort to go far beyond what any other president has done in terms of opening up the pristine wilderness area at the very uh, top of the world near the North Pole. Now, they're, they're also uh, making a bid to get heavy icebreakers. And why? They only have two right now, the U.S. government. My understanding from what I was reading is that Russia has 41 icebreakers. These are ships that, that go through sea ice and, and break it with their, the bow of the ship and form and create a pathway that other ships, commercial ships, military ships, whatever, can go through the, the ice field. Because remember, the North Pole has no land. It is all sea ice. And so, by the way, if anyone tells you that they're worried about the sea ice, the melting of the sea ice causing the oceans to rise, that is a complete, uh, completely a, a, a misunderstanding of the way that ice works because the sea ice displaces the water that, uh, and the weight of the ice uh, when the ice melts, it's, it, the water level same, stays the same. It's only the melting of, sand, of land ice that could have any effect whatsoever. So your entire North Pole, could co uh, the sea ice, could completely melt. It would have no effect on, on the le sea levels. Now, we also un have an understanding, I hope, that if sea levels were truly rising, what they're saying, then there would be an issue in a place like Manhattan, many of which is below or right at sea level, and other places, Florida, which right at sea level, much of Florida is right at sea level or very close to it. And you, have, uh, you might have other issues too where, for instance, Amsterdam, I mean uh, the Netherlands, most of which is below sea level, and they have a, co a complex uh, system of levees, very powerful, strong levees to prevent that. But they would be monitoring very closely whether or not the sea levels were rising or how much. The sea level rise in, is a non-issue in terms of climate change. And as far as that goes, climate change, whether or not it does get warmer or get colder, as it always does, it, it, the, the climate globally is always changing due to various, various natural factors, everything from uh, the sun, 
the heat of the sun actually vacillates. It goes through an 11-year cycle of the sun getting warmer and cooler, warmer and cooler, and cycles within cycles within cycles. Uh, so you have large, a small cycle, bigger cycle, bigger, bigger, bigger. Uh, same thing with the Earth cycles of volcanic activity, which can have a huge effect on the climate globally. You get an enormous eruption, for instance. It throws particles into the air, which disrupt the climate and actually can cool the climate or uh, cert, uh, under certain conditions, I guess, warm the climate because of all the particles. But it can trap the heat in the atmosphere or prevent the sun's rays from hitting the earth and they're causing, therefore causing cooler temperatures. So uh, here we have Obama poised for the cameras in front of a melting glacier. But the most interesting part of this is the time that he chose to stand in front of the glacier. It is early September right at the beginning of September, late August, early September period. This would be the time when the most melting has occurred because the glaciers begin to melt when the weather warms in the spring and, the, and then through the summer, and then it stops melting very quickly because in the Arctic regions, that fall, that cold weather just clamps down really fast, really, it's a, it's a short window when uh, the melting, the major melting occurs. So uh, I, I find it ironic that they would choose this time, but it's very carefully done when the glacier is at its lowest point. Very soon afterwards, the snow is going to start coming in and it will rebuild that glacier over the long, long winter months in that high Arctic area. So. Uh, when you see a, uh, two pictures side by side, they often do this. You have two pictures side by side of the glacier now and the glacier, let's say, six months before. And, and so you have the image of the glacier at the end of the melting cycle at, in, the fall, in the late summer or early fall, and then you have the, the picture of the glacier at the end of the cold season where it, when it would be at its highest in the spring before it starts to melt. And that would give you your most dramatic image of the shrinking glacier. Hello, glaciers actually shrink and grow every year. It's a seasonal thing. So you can say, well, over the time period, some gla these glaciers are shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Yes, that is true with some glaciers. Other glaciers grow, 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 instead of shrink, shrink, shrink. And even if every glacier on the planet only shrank, it still has nothing to do whether or not, with whether or not humans are the cause of it because this has all happened in the past before there was any any impact whatsoever of human beings on the climate on the on on planet earth uh, i had a high level climatologist a colleague of james hansen tell me that the major cause of global warming was too many people. Too many people. Rise, the rise of too many people. Well, let's not forget, though, that many of these people are living in abject poverty. They are not able to um, affect the climate as much as, let's say, an American with the air conditioning, the cars, the, the heating, all the clothes. They're buying everything that, that an American does. Whereas you have an enormous population in China, India, Africa, Central America, South America, around the world in many, many developing countries. And these people are living a hand-to-mouth existence, many without central heating, certainly without air conditioning, uh, spotty electricity, if, the, if any, uh, 
vehicles, no, not that many. Uh, in China, yeah, a small, num a small group of people are getting quite wealthy. There are cars in the big cities, but you have an enormous rural area that is very, very poverty stricken in China still. Many in Russia, even in Russia, you have tremendous amount of poverty. And more and more in the United States, we're seeing tremendous amount of poverty. Uh, people cannot, people, over 50% of Americans are on, are on some sort of government assistance. And they cannot be, they cannot afford to be just going on, you know, a lavish vacations, train, uh, airplane rides, boat rides, a lot of, they're doing the staycation thing. So uh, back to Alex Jones interviewing Larry Nichols. Uh, now this guy, again, is a consummate insider and he's a kind of a, a shady character. According to Alex Jones, he's reformed and Alex Jones claims to have known him for 20 years and has given him a lot of information about the Clintons. And the reason why I'm doing this is because, because of Hillary Clinton running for president. We know that Bill Clinton is going to be back in the picture in a big way if she does get elected president. And don't, you know, count her out because she has all these uh, legal problems with the email scandal. We cannot we could hope that they would take her down, but we can't be sure that they will. The way this world goes, the way the U.S. government goes, is the higher you are, the more insulated you are from the consequences of illegal actions. So let's start the video. It's about 21 minutes, and I'll come back and talk about it. Read the article. The local police get there and say he's clearly been murdered. Yeah, you can read the articles. When MI6 gets there, who he worked for, they say, no, uh, it's normal to zip yourself up in a duffel bag from the inside out. Well, the only time I've seen something stupider, uh, and now an inquest has found there was foul play, was when people would get their arms, legs, and head cut off and be in a plastic bag at a trash dump. You don't cut your arms and legs and head off, and then it's like saying you can cut yourself up and put yourself in a bottle like a ship in the bottle. It, it's, it's just upside down, two plus two equals 100, total malarkey bull. But this is an illustration of him hacking in. We have the Clinton chef now, Dad. Nobody likes to kill people like the Clintons. Or, as Larry Nichols says, they don't do it. People around them get the job done. And that's how La Cosa Nostra would do it. I think it's time for our friends over there. I think it's time for him to go on a vacation. And then you know what happens. But the Clintons really enjoy killing. They en Clinton enjoys getting a woman in a cloakroom with people right outside and biting them like a pit bull, biting her lip till blood drips, and then raping them. Uh, I mean, these are a savage, demonic group of people. Uh, and I don't personally even hate them. It's just I know they hate us. They hate freedom. And this dovetails with this. And I want to go over other news with Larry Nichols and continue with phone calls. Um with Mike in Oregon, another Mike in Oregon, Peter in Washington, Josh in Tennessee, Doug in Minnesota. They're on subjects all over the map. The White House trying to get this cop killing spree going. What's behind that? Larry Nichols, thank you so much for coming on with us. Hey, thank you, Alex. I didn't know you could do my voice. I didn't know I had a distinctive voice. <laughs> well, I got a raspy voice, too, but nothing like yours. I'm sure I'll get like yours, though. Well, let me say, Alex, it's... Uh, I know you take heat for having me on. I, I know that. I, but, you know, heck, I don't know what else to do. You take pound for pound the things that I have said for the years you and I have known each other. And then tell me any other, you know, it's amazing. Things I tell you, they come true. It happens. Well, the Clintons come out with their side of it. The media jumps on their side of it, attacks me and you for being around me, and then theirs ends up being a lie. But after all these years, here's Hillary running for president again, and, uh, you know, I'm still in that corner of people getting on to you for having me on. Well, it's a very small minority of people. I, I mean, I wanted to talk about 
why I admire your courage and what you've done and, and, and explain that because I think it's an important point. We expect to get heat being in the kitchen, but it, it, it's actually very mild. I would expect uh, more. I mean, people should really get it. Well, your last interview, you know, got hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube just as a gauge, millions here. Uh, and each derivative of it got hundreds of thousands. So over a million people on YouTube watched the last one. Let's let's cover this subject as we go to break, and I'll come back and try to shut up and give you the floor. You talked about maybe Obama might be the last president. Since then, he made a statement about running for a third term, wishing he could. F talk about that more. Well, the thing that everybody had better watch, Obama knows what I know. There's only two people in this world that can stop him from his agenda, which is to dedicate and make himself king, using the FEMA provisional government. And Alex, you've covered FEMA for years, so don't let anybody fool you. It's out there. They're waiting to do it. But Obama wants to be that person. And there's only two people that can stop him, Bill and Hillary Clinton, that have the power to match him. The key to this is watch Joe Biden. If Joe Biden gets in the race, then you can count on it with everything you got. Obama's planning to stay. And he's going to do what he's got to do to be able to stay there. Now, the question is, do you want Obama to be comes? You've got Hillary. She's waiting for her day. And if she can just get in this election, then she will make it collapse. Now, Alex, it's a question of whether we, the people, want to be an Islamic caliphate under Obama and lead him to global power as the leader of Islam worldwide, or do we want to become a communist country under Hillary, with Hillary appointing Bill Clinton, which I know she's going to do with them. I, I might months. choose the Muslim <laughs> thing other than being a commie. <laughs> huh? I might choose the Muslim deal over being a communist. I, well, I'm telling you, Muslims cut your head off. Commies just put you in prison. I, you know, it's a six of one another. But I will say this. Within six months, Hillary will appoint Bill Ambassador to the U.N. And then because of what they've been doing in the U.N. with the Clinton Foundation, within six months of that, they plan on him being the Secretary General of the United Nations, or in other words, the leader of the U.N., can you imagine they will have achieved what they told me about in 1986? They want to be the most powerful couple ever in the history of the world. I skipped the network break. This is so cliffhanger and so key. Go back to those talks because Clinton has now said, it was like a decade after you said it on my show, that he wants to be the leader of the UN with Hillary down the road being co-president. And then they bring in the world government. And then Obama, I didn't used to buy into this, but really he is trying to set up a caliphate. He is fighting right. the radical Islamicists. There is a takeover. He is doing it through Kenya. I mean, it's such double dealing. I guess they really are like on their own teams trying to get global domination. Talk about that more. Well, you know, that's the problem, Alex. We've got the best government money can buy. The problem is the people in America don't have money to buy it. But you now have two distinct people trying to get control of this nation. And it's all going to hinge on a thing called the FEMA Provisional Government Plan. Whoever is president when a crisis is declared nationally, when that day comes, whoever's president becomes king. Now, the way that works so people will know, whoever's president takes total power. There is no vice president. Number two is the commander of the Joint Chief Staff. All Congress and senators go back to their home states and they become the government there now what that does is the president when that happens becomes king and the only person that can call the crisis over is the president and as you know nobody's going to do that in 1986 the clintons found out about this and Bill and Hillary both came to me and said, we want to be there that day. Get us there. Well, we joked. Alice, can you imagine back in 1986, Bill Clinton and us, all of the guys that were on the kitchen cabinet and him saying he wanted to be president? And we're going, oh, yeah, sure. Of course. Well, we devised a plan to make him president, but we figured the womanizing and all that stuff would get him. So it was a joke. But we started looking at reality. If we ever got him there, if he couldn't crash in FEMA when he was president, then you had four out years, which were the years when his term ended and then Hillary would run. Well, you know what happened? She got beat by Obama because she didn't follow our playbook. 
She's following it now. That's why I can tell you every second what Hillary's doing. I can tell you, don't worry about all of this email stuff, except all of this sudden, in comes Alec, the FBI. Now, remember, Obama just appoints a new head of the Justice Department, a new director, you know, the attorney general. And all of a sudden, this attorney general six the FBI on these FBI files. Now, Alex, let's tell the truth about that, buddy. Number one, if they prosecute Hillary over the FBI or over the emails, it'll never happen. Because, you see, if they prosecute her over that, Alex, then she's going to say, well, then I've got to use these classified emails as my defense. Well, when she says that, then the federal judge is going to say, well, you can't use that stuff as your defense. And then, therefore, he's going to throw the case out. He has to throw the case out. The Clintons know this. But there's one thing laying right there. Obama's got Biden getting in that race. They're going to kick Hillary down and kick her down. And if they can get Biden in, Alex, it's over. It's over. It'll never happen. There won't be an election. Obama's going to have a right. I think you see the intensity now over this Black Lives Matter. That's what I wanted I to raise. Working at the highest levels of this, even as the New York Times admitted you were one of Clinton's top people uh, in there in the original planning. Obviously, I can see the angles of it, destabilization, all the problems. But the boldness of having Democratic Party operatives running, admittedly, all these kill the cop groups, they think they can get away with that. I guess they will. They will get away with so it. So what's the point of it? Well, the point is, this is a between the Clintons and the Obama. I don't say Obamas, I mean Obama. And where do we sit? Where do we, the people, sit in the middle of this? Well, we have got to stand up, Alex, and your program is part of it. We've got to stand up and declare we're not going to take it. And we can through states' rights, but we got to get to moving on it or it's over. But just sit back, folks, and know, I'm, hey, I'm not here telling you about Obama. Look for yourself. Do you really believe that all of these, these Black Lives Matter things are really occurring just out of the blue? Do you not think it odd that Obama has not sent his Justice Department to shut this stuff down? Hey, Alex, you get out there and tell your audience, hey, let's go kill a cop. See how long you can move around. I'm going to be arrested See, in about two hours. To your jail. Yeah. So you know that's out there. Well, then you got to ask why, folks. I'm not trying to get you to buy into a pig in the poke. I'm asking you, ask yourself why. Why is it when Obama was elected, we were told, oh, thank God, race is finally over. And he's done everything in his power and then some to make race a hotter issue now than the day the man came in. And if you don't believe he is working hard to get these riots activated, and when the riots, the riots get activated, Alex, here's the part people don't understand. When these black mobs start running wild and shooting wildly into the neighborhood, you know what people are doing in this country? They'll call up and say, please send the government and stop it, protect us. We will call for the federal government to come in and protect us. We will call for the civil emergency. We will. We'll be the ones asking for it because, you know what, we'll be scared. We'll be scared. Now, I'll tell you something else, you might as well know, and y'all going to think I'm crazy, but get ready to grease the banana truck because I'm fixing to tell you. There's a reason Cuba, we normalize relations with Cuba. Alex, you know, you've talked to enough military people yourself, and you know Obama has gone through and selectively purged the military for anybody that would dare to not take his orders under a crisis condition in this country. They're gearing up. They're getting everything lined up. Get up. Well, watch this, folks. You see, Obama and his people, and I'm sure the generals have told them, when it comes to telling American soldiers to crack down on the people of America, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. It'll end pretty quick. So what has Obama done? He's gone to the one military force that I personally ran into in Nicaragua. He's got the Cuban military that will be brought in here under the auspices of augmenting our military 
to help keep us in line. You know, I'd laugh at that, except I remember it was in the Washington Post after I saw it in restricted documents that were leaked about 14 years ago, right after 9-11, where they were saying in the Washington Post, we'll have Canadian and Mexican and other Latin American troops in America during a civil emergency. It predates Obama and the Clintons. And then it expanded uh, to where they're now openly pushing this idea again. And so we know they have a plan for a multinational force once there's a civil war. Uh, but that does make a lot of sense. And the Pope's coming here to call for socialism and world government. I mean, everything's really moving fast now. Everything is moving according to an area of time. And has it, as you get closer to an event, time compresses. And that's where we're at. But now remember, why Cuba? Why did we have to normalize relations with Cuba? Because that's the only place that has a standing army within two hours, can put 200,000 troops on our ground. Europe can't do it. Russia can't do it. And by the way, ain't doing real good getting along Well, that's what they Russia. do in Red Dawn is they dress Cubans up like Mexicans, fly them in on jumbo jets with the noses popping off. And, 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 and used to, I'd say this is crazy, even though I knew the Soviets had a plan to do this. But the thing is, they're so crazy, Obama's now renaming mountains like a dictator. I now mean, they're just getting us ready. That was one of the things that we did under Clinton. Clinton would say, well, how am I going to hide this? I'll say, put it right under their nose. That's where nobody will find it. Put it right there. Nobody will believe it. When we say things, Alex, think about the things you have said. Think about the things I've said with you over the years. Remember when they were said that was crazy? That was even crazy. That was so far. Well, I know they're thinking about martial law. That's admitted. And I know the White House is trying to start a race war. I mean, who knows what's going to happen next? That was a pretty interesting interview with Larry Nichols, uh, who was a part of the kitchen cabinet for the Clintons during the Clinton uh, years back in the 80s, the late 80s. And he's obviously still has some inside information about the plans for uh, the future of the United States. Um, a lot of people would laugh at this and think that, okay, you know, this, is a, this has got to be a joke. You know, everything is going to go on. There'll be, there will be an election, and it'll be decided, and it will continue on. And that very well may be the way it works. But we cannot discount the possibility that change can happen. It is the nature of reality. That that's the way the world is. Changes do happen. Unexpected things do happen. And for Larry Nich Nichols to say that a, a FEMA regional, uh, provisional government may completely deep six uh, the democratic process, if the crisis were big enough, then I think that is the plan that they would do this. We've already seen this happen in small, in a small way. Uh, for instance, after the Boston bombing, locked, the lockdown of a major part of Boston, Newtown, in which the military and the police went door to door, rousting people out of their homes, running them down the street with their hands up. And you can look at the video of this, uh, suppose, and l searching for the young man who they claimed was the one who was or the two young men who were was supposedly responsible for the, the Boston bombings. Uh, and then, of course, they missed him, and he was hiding in a boat in a neighborhood in Newtown. And when the lockdown was over, and the guy who lived in the house where the boat was came out, he noticed that there was some blood, I guess, on the boat, and called the cops, and sure enough, the young man, the kid, was hiding in, hiding in the boat. And uh, so things like this do happen. Lockdowns do happen. This is a word that we're hearing more and more of in uh, common parlance. It is originally a prison term. 
And this would be when you have a maximum security prison, medium security prison. Everyone is locked into their cells at the same time for some in because of some incident, locked down in their cells. And so this terminology has been extended to the United States as a whole. And we, and we, we see this in schools. Uh, in the young kids, the young kids are locked down in their rooms, uh, doors locked. <clears throat> so more and more the American citizenry are being uh, taught that, that uh, this is part of normal reality, that not lockdown is something that may happen to them and they should just go along with it. Uh, for their own safety. Well, the reality is, of course, that many of these crises are actually created by the government. They're hoaxes and they're, uh, the government is actually using the crisis to bring about a ne the next level of, of control that they are seeking, that they are desiring. And I'll give you an example of this. This would be the latest example. Of course, these happen almost every week now. Uh, you had the train going from, I think, Amsterdam to Paris. And we are told, the story is that um, a Islamic radical came out of the bathroom and he was loaded down with guns he had an AK-47, he had, an AK and he had a handgun, he had clips, he had a box cutter even, um, and he shot and seriously wounded someone and three Marines tackled him. And I remember hearing on the radio that one of the Marines said he was asleep and his buddy woke him up and said, let's go. And they went and they did it. And they did the heroic thing and they tackled the guy because his gun jammed. And they beat him up, beat him into unconsciousness. Does this seem familiar somehow? Let's go. Do you remember in 9-11, the plane that eventually... Uh, crashed in Pennsylvania, and the famous line, let's roll, that was said by someone on his cell phone. He was talking to his family member or something, and then he goes, I love you, honey, and then he, you hear him say, let's roll, and then click, and then the plane goes down. And we can only surmise that he and his fellow passengers decided to fight instead of passively uh, being driven into the White House, which I think was supposedly where that plane was supposed to be headed. And so they, instead of, fa they, they, they at least prevented uh, ha more havoc in Washington, D.C., even though they sacrificed their lives heroically. Well, this is a little bit like that, but on a much smaller scale. There's only one problem with this whole narrative about this train incident. And that is that apparently never happened. There was no one shot and seriously wounded. Uh, and uh, the guy who was a strapping Muslim whose picture was broadcast as having been the attacker, a really a young, handsome, strong-looking Muslim, he was actually a, a homeless guy who was very sickly, uh, malnourished from... Morocco, who, they, who was sleeping under bridges and in parks, and in, I forget if he was in Paris or Amsterdam, one of those towns, and suddenly he, he's on this train brandishing this handgun. So, and also, the, the, the guy who tackled him was not three Marines. They may have been there, but it wasn't the, he wasn't 
as threatening, nearly as threatening as the first reports stated. Nevertheless, the first reports are the one that stand in people's minds. And what is the result of this? You have the president of France declaring that uh, it is amazing that the wonderful three Marines averted a potential serious situation and that this is it is really now important to beef up the security in the train stations to prevent this type of thing from happening. You might wonder, well, the security is already pretty tight at, at train stations. How did this guy get in a, this Moroccan or whoever, whoever he was, get on the train with all this gear in the first place? Did his handlers perhaps stow the gear in the bathroom? The story that the one of the Marines told was that they heard they were passing the bathroom on the train and they heard a, a clicking of a AK-47 being loaded in the bathroom and they waited until they came out and then they attacked him after he shot this guy, supposedly. And uh, you might wonder, well, you know, how would they know that that was the sound of an AK-47 being loaded or being cocked or maybe uh, the, the uh, magazine being slammed into the gun, whatever, you know, where they, pu they pop it into the gun. Uh, and, well, somehow they were, it sounds very cool and everything like a movie, but you have to wonder how much of this is just fiction and what would be the purpose of this, of this fiction. And clearly though, it's obvious when you see the results, which would be increased security, a higher level of military and police presence in the train stations in Europe. And also, it's the fear factor. And what it is really is the essence of terrorism. The essence of terrorism is terror, instilling a sense of terror in the population allows you to control them more completely. You keep people worried, you keep people uh, from feeling complacent and happy, you take away uh, their feeling of, of comfort, you prevent them from having this. Because and you might say, why? Why would governments want to do this? They want to do it because it serves their interests in many different ways. One way, and this is obvious, is that a fearful population is more likely to give money to the government to keep the government running at a high level to give money, to, to pay their taxes, to fund more weapons, more men, more training, more a high, uh, high level of, of uh, research and development to make even more weapons, more advanced weapons. And why? You might say, oh, to protect from the enemy. But both sides are doing this. There, there is always an enemy I mean, now we have the enemy being Muslims, right? Communism, no longer a threat. No longer the boogeyman that, that people like me lived with our entire lives as we were growing up. Now it's different. Ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, right away, within a matter of a year or two, the, the new threat appeared and it's a global threat and it can the source of the threat is slippery it changes it morphs it becomes it's al-qaeda no it's not al-qaeda it's isis in fact general petraeus the disgraced former commander of the european uh command uh actually suggested recently that, that 
Al-Qaeda should be used to fight, fight ISIS, that Al-Qaeda could actually team up and partner and ally with the United States and its allies against ISIS. Well, both, first of all, both ISIS and Al-Qaeda were created by the same people, and that would be the, the Western intelligence, the various Western intelligence agencies, including the CIA, Mossad, and other intelligence agencies. We underestimate the power of the intelligence agencies. We call them intelligence agencies, but actually they are a whole level of government operating globally out and beyond the purview, the overview of the American people and of the legislators to a large extent, except for a very few top level people who control more or less what they do. I mean, we have somebody like John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who some people believe was the last true American president, who actually attempted to destroy the CIA by breaking it up into many, many much smaller agencies to greatly decrease the CIA's power. And of course, we all know what happened to him. Because, uh, I mean, it has now been established that I think beyond a shadow of a doubt for those people who truly look into this and are willing to look honestly at the assassination of JFK, we can see that clearly it was not a lone nut gunman, that Oswald was uh, a part of the military uh, uh, in the intelligence community himself and was an operative and was used as a, he was set up over a period of years, being sent to Russia, defecting, then returning, um, to make it look as if he was a communist, uh, having him uh, hand out pro-Cuba leaflets in New Orleans, uh, even though it was known that he was very anti-communist. But he was just doing his job. He was doing his, playing his role as an agent, a secret agent. Did not understand that he was being set up for the big show that was coming down the road uh, in which the president would be removed. The vice president would become the new, the, lead, the first leader of the new, the new world the New World Order uh, president, that would be uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, a very corrupt, compromised, and ruthless, and self-serving, and ambitious politician who hated the Kennedys, by the way. And uh, we have a lot of information about that, at the very least, Johnson knew what was coming for his president. Uh, we see a complete turnaround in American policy, foreign policy, after the death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, in which Johnson ramps up, escalates the Vietnam War. Why? Well, the ostensible reason is to fight communism. Well, the insiders knew that that really was not what it was about at the very top, that it was really about gaining control over the population of the United States in the long run. And now we're seeing the results playing out from the late 50s to early 60s. Now in 2015, we're seeing where all this has led us to the point where uh, the, the office of the president has more and more power. And we have people like Larry Nichols actually claiming that the plan is to cancel the election completely. I don't think that will happen because the American people just wouldn't stand for it on many, many different levels and the military itself because without the military backing any kind of a coup, that's what this would be, you couldn't really do this. You need the man with the gun able to support you in your efforts to 
uh, overthrow the established order. And Alex Jones and Larry Nichols were talking about bringing in the Cubans and foreign military to actually enforce the changes that they're in the power structure that they are planning. In a way, though, the, the way it will probably play out, and unless people can turn it around, will be that Jeb and Hillary will fight it out. And you, it doesn't matter whether Jeb or Hillary win. It's the same incremental steps toward more and more power concentrated in the executive branch that it and the, remember the chief executive is the commander of the armed forces and there were, and as they mentioned Obama is purging the U.S. military of officers high level officers who would not be willing to go along with whatever commands that the, their commander in chief makes and that's because they forget they would forget that the Constitution supersedes the commander-in-chief. That's the number one law of the land, the way it's written. And this is also why we see a lot of the denigration of the Constitution uh, as a living document, for instance. That's, and meaning that it is not set in stone. Living document is the, com the opposite of something which is set in stone like the Ten Commandments, something like that. Uh, the Constitution was made difficult to change on purpose, very difficult, to, uh, for amendments to be made. You need uh, to, go, to jump through all these hoops in order to, to amend or change the Constitution. The only way that they've been able successfully to change the Constitution is by parsing details and interpreting them in different ways or just ignoring it completely uh, and just trying to make it look like the Constitution is it's just uh, like something there's something untrustworthy and dangerous about the Constitution like the Bible you know uh, people who have the Constitution and the Bible in their cars, you know, and they, they cite them. They cite the Constitution. They're a suspect. And this actually is part of the training that military and police are now getting. That these are the potential terrorists uh, and that, uh, like for instance, if a person has a copy of the Constitution and a Bible in their car, that would be probable cause that they might be uh, contemplating a terrorist act. And, and I say contemplating because now you are hearing more and more calls for somehow law enforcement to stop these crimes before they happen. And this would require that the citizenry are under a level of surveillance that we can use algorithms and, and surveillance computers to actually anticipate what people are thinking or planning to do or even before they plan it just by thinking about it. They, those who are most likely to, to commit a crime or let's say a terrorist act would be, brought, would be stopped before they do it. There was a movie about this called Minority Report, Report from a Philip K. Dick novel. Very good movie. Very uh, much looking into the future with driverless cars like we're seeing now uh, or just starting to roll out the driverless cars and enormous trucks going down the highway with no driver that are completely robotic. Uh, tandem in, uh, vehicles, huge, heavy, uh, and supposedly they're going to be on the road very soon uh, and maybe safer than uh, a car, a truck with a driver. I don't know about that. 
I just wish they would go back to the trains. I mean, trains are way safer than trucks or cars and a lot more efficient. You can carry tr a tremendous amount of cargo on a train. Anyway, um, I mean, they're still using the trains, but not to the level that they used to be. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, this is like the way in which uh, we look and we try to see into the future of the way things could go and if uh, we can stop it before it happens, that's a good thing. Uh, on an individual level, I'm not so sure if it's such a good thing because you could never know for sure what a person is going to do unless, like in the Minority Report, you can actually have a psychic and uses ESP to look into the future, and then you can, oh yeah, you know it's true. That's why it's called Minority Report, because it was a secret that one of the psychics might have a different vision of the future that, was, that would exonerate the perpetrator or the pre-crime criminal. Uh, or the thought criminal, if you want to use Orwellian terms. The minority report would contradict the majority report. And uh, the Tom Cruise character does not even know that it was such a thing as a minority report uh, that would cast doubt on uh, whether a person truly was 100% going to commit a crime in the future for which they could be uh, arrested using pre-crime. Uh, and Tom, the Tom Cruise character arrests a person at the beginning of the movie and you are under arrest for the pre-crime of murder. <laughs> the pre-crime of murder, he tells him that. It's like, whoa, but he, and the guy goes, but I, I didn't do it, I, didn't, I wasn't going to. I, um, and they just haul him off and put him into this uh, coma, sort of a sub semi-conscious state where they, people live, they're alive, but they're not a problem anymore because they're, so it's a very interesting movie. A, a lot of science fiction um, utilizes information that, the, that most, most people don't have and this they look into it. And a, an artist oftentimes is, is really interested in the future and because they understand that if you can if you get can have an understanding of trends then you can you can benefit from that and this is what uh, anybody who is wealthy tries to uh, tries to do if you it gives you an edge it gives you a leg up on events to know that the direction the, that events are leading you, and then you can prepare yourself accordingly. Now, some people really poo-poo this, but I think it's really important uh, for, for most people who are interested in prospering in this world to have an understanding. Um, all through history, artists have uh, over and over and over been preoccupied with the future. Well, whether they call themselves science fiction writers or science fiction filmmakers or whatever, they are wanting to be at the forefront of the trends. And unfortunately, we get a, we see a uh, oftentimes a kind of a a watered down version of this with fashion. Those who are the most cool wear the cutting edge fashion. And of course this is kind of ridiculous in a way because it's all about appearances. It's not real events. It's phony. It's manufactured. And, but if you wear the cutting edge clothes style, then that somehow gives you an edge. Gives you, makes you uh, of a, a higher status. People give you more respect. And that's what people want. Uh, so there is something to be said for looking at the future, but in a real way, in a genuine way. And 
people like Larry Nichols, is he right? Is he wrong? Is he blowing smoke? Or is this for real? Only time will tell. So that's all for this week. Enjoy your weekend and sleep well.